It's that time again. To cover the ominous and strange last photos, we're going to change things up a little bit though. Not only is this video going to run longer, and that is thanks to your guys' feedback, but the photos themselves. In the previous three episodes, we've seen people before their final moments, and some history behind it. However, this time, we're going to invite mystery into the mix with the last photos of people who went missing, and people's last moments. Let's begin. December 10th, 2021. A tornado in Missouri is forming. A family is preparing for safety by huddling together in the house bathroom. In the photo, we have three sisters who seem by appearance of the photo to be handling the situation well. The two youngest, Ava and Alana, are taking cover in the bathtub with their older sister Aniston standing right beside them. The mother sends this photo to their aunt to share with her that they are taking safety precautions for the expected storm. Fifteen minutes later, the house would be split in half. It's said to be the deadliest tornado streak in history, with many tornadoes hitting multiple states, taking the lives of around 89 people, and cutting across a path of up to 250 miles. The house was split apart and the family would be launched yards away into a field. Being in a house with no basement, they did what they could, hiding in a windowless bathroom. Most of the family would survive, all that is except for Aniston. The mother would be critically injured, but she would recover. This incident isn't from that long ago. I'm speaking of Cameron Robbins, the 18 year old who was dared by his friends to jump off a cruise ship at night. This story had a lot of coverage. It should be known that doing such a stunt is betting against your life and favorable odds that you will not survive. It's reported that only 25% of people who fall from cruise ships are recovered. Cameron's motive was simply that of his friends recording him and betting him to do it. Things to factor in the chance of survival are the speed of the ship, the location, the time of day, and the season. What's mind-boggling to many in this scenario is that Cameron began to go for the buoy and seemed to have noticed something and swam away from it. Many people suggest he noticed a shark. And this is not an unrealistic theory, as sharks are known to hang around cruise ships due to the wasted food that is emptied out while out in the water. This already becomes a hot spot for sharks. No one can say for certain what it is that changed Cameron's mind to stop swimming towards the buoy except for himself. And unfortunately, that day is likely to never come. As the rate of survival is extremely low, so much time has already passed. And this is the last that we have seen from him. The reality of watching your safety ride away while being left in freezing waters and being left alone in darkness would truly be a nightmare. This photo dates back to 2008, and although I consider any person next to a bear to be in a dangerous position, it does dampen the blow when the person happens to be a trainer. However, with that said, it wouldn't give Stephen Miller, the trainer here, immunity from what would happen next. This was a setup for a commercial. The commercial would present Stephen and the bear getting in a fight. However, it said somewhere during the playful fight, the bear must have become disoriented and continued an actual attack on Stephen, quickly sealing his fate before those nearby could stop the bear. This one, although brief, doesn't undermine the tragedy, and as far as how this could have went wrong, hindsight is 2020. This one has bugged me for some time now. As with most of these, we have a conclusion, and although this one has one, it's what happened that has no answer. If you're not familiar with this image, it leads to quite the rabbit hole. And with this incident occurring in 2014, there has been time for speculation, rumors, and even new evidence. However, we still don't know what happened to Chris Kremers and Lazana Froon. Here they are together, visiting the country of Panama. They would be there for a short time visiting family and helping children. 
This picture starts around the time of their disappearance. They just don't know it yet. Together, they sought out to hike a trail before leaving the country. However, two of the more common theories is the first one being they got lost once reaching the top of the mountain and couldn't find their way back and got lost at night. The other common theory is that they had their lives taken by someone else, possibly a tour guide or someone else, as several people had ended up with their lives gone around this location within years apart. What is for certain is that both phones attempted a call for emergency. The first attempt at 4.39 p.m. and the second attempt at 4.51 p.m., both trying from their cell phones separately. These were the last and only calls they made that day. The strange thing is, a few calls were made the next day calling out for emergency. In fact, the days following would see phone calls made out to emergency for up until a week. There's something that bugs me with the call activity. As you can see Chris's phone making the last calls, but strangely her pin settings had started locking her out, or somebody else, or the pin was removed entirely. Lizana's phone battery was empty by April the 4th. Just a brief reminder that their hike began on the 1st. And what leaves me with so many questions is Chris's phone on the last two days it was used. There's a five day gap from the time it was checked last, from the 6th to the 11th, and it still had 22% battery. These photos of what seemed to be two happy friends enjoying a vacation and even helping kids, as with one had it within her profession, would go on this hike and take these photos on the 1st of April. It takes an unsettling turn when no more photos would be taken until. April the 8th. There are around 90 photos, and most of them take place at night between 1 and 4 in the morning. It's suggested that this could have been for the purpose of the camera flash to help them move around at night, with it being dark. Or, that this in fact could have been someone else using their camera. Some of the remains would be recovered from the women in late August of the same year, 2014. This case remains unsolved. Other head-scratching moments in this case are that of Chris's bones being bleached with no tissue attached. The strange thing is only her body was discovered this way. Also, several of her bones were broken, including her pelvis being in half, and the other side never recovered. Also, the bleaching was not caused by the sun, but by some other agent. Research found it strange that the bones show no signs of erosion being in the water or any signs of scratching. The theories are endless. Coming back to the hair photo, some even suggest that this could be someone else's hair in the corner. This is a case that will always stick with me, and one I'd be curious to know your thoughts on. This one is more recent at the time of this recording. The photo here showing Travis King. He is the man in the black hat and black shirt. The reason I share this is because it is possible this could be his last photo and how unbelievable people truly can be. This photo was taken at the demilitarized zone, the line between North Korea and South Korea. King was arranged to head back to the United States by army command. He was a private second class, and in the last October, he would be in trouble for damaging a South Korean police vehicle in an altercation with police. Following this would be assault charges in July. 
to King's motive advantage, he purchased a tour ticket of the two zones. And instead of boarding the airplane, he did the unthinkable. It's reported he ran and laughed into the North Korean zone. Some thought it was a prank. King would then be apprehended by North Korean officials and put in a van and taken away. For context and in contrast, as many know, North Korea is a country you do not want to enter for its outlandish laws and poor and strict conditions. Here is footage of a soldier who desperately fled from the country just a few years ago, taking several shots as he crossed the line, but luckily surviving. One of many other recent examples is Otto Warmbier, who took down a hotel poster while visiting the country to take home. For this, he would be arrested and sentenced 15 years to hard labor. After negotiations, he would be returned to the US a year later in a vegetative state, then passing away. Only time will tell for Travis King. This photo has been around for some time, and it has bugged me, as I'm sure it has with many others, by its unsettling nature. The woman in this photo is believed by many to be Tara Calico, who went missing in 1988 in September. Then this photo appeared in June of 1989. Tara had disappeared near her home in New Mexico, and of all places for this photo to appear, it was in a parking lot to a convenience store in Florida. There are those who believe that this isn't Tara though, people who are skeptic, and many of those who do believe it's her. One of those believers is Tara's mom. In the photo, you can see a book placed next to her by the author V.C. Andrews. This is one of Tara's favorite authors. It's possible this could have been on her or allowed at the captor's request to have some kind of comfort items. But this goes back to the point that her own mother believes this is her daughter looking back at her through the Polaroid, a little weathered and without makeup. In this wanted photo for Tara, there is a two year age gap. She is 18 on the left side and 16 on the right side. Personally, I think she does look different in just two years with a different hairstyle. And although the makeup hasn't changed that much, I still see a little difference. So, for those who don't think it's her, I want to turn the saturation down on the Polaroid and compare. Do you think that this could be her? I'm curious if you see it or if you don't see it. I think her mother truly believing it does give it some weight. There have been a couple more photos, although Tara's mom doesn't believe this to be her and thinks it's staged. And if that's the case, it truly is a disgusting prank. She would receive photos from the police for years of missing people, including the remains of others, to see if she thought it was her daughter or not. This photo takes place on an Amtrak train. The arm wrappings are loose, and the mother claimed a train being a public transit wouldn't make much sense with so many witnesses. I think she has a point, but I never want to fully discredit something until knowing for certain. This photo is even more difficult to understand when the boy in it also remains unidentified. He was thought to be another case of a missing child, but that case would later be solved and this wasn't him. It's mind boggling that decades later we don't have an official answer for who these two people are and of all places, it was found in a parking lot. Heather Teague was sunbathing by the Ohio River in 1995. On her side of the river, she would be taken in the rays from the sun with her back facing up. Right across from Heather Teague would be someone from their home observing her through his telescope. Whether he was generally looking around the beach or just watching her is debatable. It was late August and Heather was more than likely just enjoying the weather a brunette woman weighing no more than 100 pounds. Tim Walhall, the man watching through the telescope, saw someone come out from the trees behind Heather with a weapon and had forced Heather up and took her back into the woods. The only witness was Tim Walhall. 45 minutes later, 
he would make his first call to the police. State Police, Dispatch Davis. Uh, yes, sir. I just called the Indiana State Police. I live in Newburgh, Indiana. Mm -hmm. And, I mean, I was sitting at the dinner table, we got to eat dinner, and I got a telescope. I live out on the river. Mm -hmm. And I scanned the beach over straight across from the beach from the Lock and Dam. Mm -hmm. And there was a girl on the left hand side of the trees down here, and she was sunbathing, and she was laying face down. And she had her top undone, and she was just bathing. And uh, I was looking back and forth across the beach, I told Karen, I, and I said, you know, I just listened to her. I said, I'll just, I, you know, I just looked at the beach. And about this time, a guy come running out of the trees on the left hand side, and he ran down and grabbed her by the back of the head of the hair and jerked her up. And she grabbed the towel and he, he, he walked her up in the trees, up on, in the riverbank over here. Mm. And I've been watching now for 25 minutes and I ain't seen her coming back. And all of her stuff still sat down there on the beach. Where is she at on the beach, sir? She was, you know where the new lock dam is? The Newburgh Lock and Dam? Yes, sir. Uh, right straight on that big long beach and she's almost at the end of the lock wall on your side. 10-4. I just drove through that area where the dam is. I didn't see one there, but I'll go back. Um, and Broadview subdivision in and out. This was the last time Heather was seen, as she was described to be dragged into the woods by a six-foot captor who looked to weigh around 200 pounds with no shirt on. Tim Walthall never did make contact with any other authorities. He waited 45 minutes before talking with Indiana authorities. A local farmer had been checking his crops in the area due to vandalism that day and noticed a red Ford Bronco parked next to Heather's vehicle. This information was relayed to authorities and Walthall's suspect sketch was identical to that of the man they found who owned the Bronco, who went by the name Sonny Dill. During an air quotes, routine traffic stop, Police discovered a couple of guns, knives, duct tape, rubber gloves, rope, and hair resembling Heather's, and blood stains inside the tailgate. Unfortunately, we don't know for sure if it was Sonny, also known as Martin. When police showed up to Sonny Dill's residence later, it was too late. He had taken fate into his own hands, removing the primary suspect from this case. The case remains open, but it's said local authorities have unofficially considered it closed, with Martin Dill as the one responsible. Sadly, Heather's body has never been found. Had it been recovered, I wanted to suggest the possibility of checking the blood from the Bronco and test it with today's forensics, or even test the hair. But unfortunately, this will have to remain a mystery, even with its strong evidence. Like and subscribe for more, and this video is thanks to my subscribers who suggested I make longer videos. So it must be said again, a big thank you to my viewers. If you'd like to support my channel, leaving a like helps. Share with a friend, or consider donating to my Patreon. Details in the description box below. Take care.